Hello, it's Marcia Simone Cadogan from Canaan Bridges Consulting. Episode 5 of Actors and in Interest in Creative and Cultural Industries examines the significance of time, space, and creativity to Canada's creative industries. My chat with Dr. Cheryl Thompson, professor and author from Ryerson University, traces out these dynamics. Stay tuned. Hello and we- welcome to another episode in our series where we focus on actors and interests in the creative and cultural industries, reorientating resilience. Today's guest is Dr. Cheryl Thompson. She's a professor and a prof- prolific author. She's written a number of books and articles that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. She's a professor at Ryerson University in the School of Creative Industries. Dr. Thompson, thank you for joining me today. It's so great to have you on board. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. Mm-hmm. It's really good to see you. For starters, tell us about yourself. If a key stakeholder in the creative industries were to spend, you know, say one minute with you, what should they know about you? I mean, the first thing they should know is that I am not just an academic. I have had many life experiences, many of them that I bring with me. So for example, I was a student athlete when I was younger. I worked- Yeah, I, I played I played um, NCAA soccer and I also threw the javelin competitively. Yes. Wow. Um, I also, as a child, myself and my sister we were competitive chess players so i bring a little bit of that energy with me still Mm -hmm. um and we also um you know played um piano and we we would compete at like conservatories and all that so i did so i have the musical elements with me as well and then i worked professionally for eight years before i decided to go and do my phd and i would start with telling them that to understand that for me life is about the continuity of the experiences that you have, mm-hmm. not about breaks in time. So often people break time in their bio and say, oh, I used to do this, but I'm this now. Yeah. I bring everything with me. So I am a professor and an author, public speaker today, but a part of me is still that chess player at like mm-hmm. 10. <laughs> that's still part of the story too. Oh, that's so, I really like that. That's so interesting. So you're, you're an all around achiever. I actually missed out the public speaking thing. I, I, I forgot to mention that you're also a public speaker, which is. Yeah. But the funny thing is I would never describe my, it's funny. I wouldn't describe myself as an achiever. Like I, 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 for me, I, I am, I'm an opportunity seeker. So if somebody comes to me with a, with an opportunity, for example, when I said that I played NCAA soccer, um, that was not a dream. It literally happened to me one day at the high school, I was in grade 11. Some, somebody came to the high school asking about me and then they left a letter with, with my guidance counselor. So then the guidance counselor called me down to the office. I thought I was getting in trouble. <laughs> and the, the, the guidance counselor said, no, someone came and gave us this letter. So I'm, I'm just, here you go. I opened the letter and the letter is, hi, I'm a recruiter for US schools. I saw, I've seen you play all season. I think you have what it takes. Can I come and meet with you? And just like a scene out of the movie, the recruiter came to the house. <laughs> My parents and my family were sitting on the couch. My mother oh, brought, out, brought out some tea and the rest is history. It was not something that I sought. It was something that came to me. So I took I took up the offer when it came to me. Mm-hmm. And, and that's often been the story in my life. I just take up the opportunity. And I think a lot of people resist that and they get nervous and they, they start to get in their head about they're not good enough and they don't mm-hmm. deserve it. And then they say no to those opportunities. I just never do that. So I would say I'm more of an opportunity seeker than an achiever. Interesting. Wow, okay. So then let's talk about your role as a professor at Ryerson University. 
Is there a specific course that you teach that speaks to how history and culture shape dominant perspectives on what counts as important to, you know, sustainability in Canada's creative industries? I actually think this question cuts across all my courses, even yeah. though they're very different. So I teach the intro course in creative industries, which is like an overview of the things that you would experience in this field. It's very broad based. So we talk about the film industry, we talk about labor, we talk about globalization, we talk about the creative city and the gentrification happening in cities and the, the, the creative class and how cities are being built to attract a certain type of uh, professional who fits into the creative sectors in some capacity. And so all of that conversation is about not just Canada, but right. Canada and its relation to the world. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about not when people hear the hear the word sustainability, yes, they often think environment. But the way I teach it in my classes is like, no, sustainability is about labor, about resources, about knowledge, about information, about um, you know mm -hmm. the material culture that goes along with the creative industries, especially in the industry like fashion. Yes. There's a materiality to that work. Mm -hmm that is very much about sustainability, not just about greenwashing or, you know, saving the planet. It's like, true. So, many, so in all my courses, especially that course, I try to get students to think holistically about the world. And I often use the analogy in the class about an ecosystem mm -hmm. that just like the, because they, in the business world, they like to use the word ecosystem. Yes. And yet, businesses are often run in imbalance whereas the actual ecosystem is all about balance and proportionality that's right, right. yeah so so we use that analogy but we actually don't even know what it means right <laughs> and we don't understand that in the actual ecosystem mm -hmm. everything understands its place and everything is there to help each other mm -hmm. out so the little shrubs and the trees and all the weeds and all the stuff they know their role and they know that they a tree doesn't want to trample over the shrubs yes the tree understands that that's not my role whereas in the real world people are taking on roles and trampling over people and doing things that are actually about imbalance not not balance mm -hmm. so a lot of what i try to teach students in my courses is to actually and part of this is, I think, my own outlook on life, where I try right. to keep a balanced perspective. Mm -hmm. I try to teach them that balance and being balanced and thinking about things in perspective is actually a, a part of the sustainability discussion. Okay, good. It's it's good that you've drawn that you've you have that perspective that perspective because a lot of times we really do believe that sustainability is just all about climate change, the environment, and then there's so many different aspects to it. So it's good that you bring this in your course, not just one, but all of them, whether as a, an upfront discussion or an underlying theme throughout the other parts of your, your, your the, the sections of your course. That's great. So let's now talk about, you know, you being an author, because you've written two books that are really interesting and, and important not only in the Canadian space as in terms of race and culture and so on, but also when we talk about creativity and culture as well and resilience in the space. What motivated you? One of your book is called uh, Uncle Race, Nostalgia and the Politics of, of Loyalty. What motivated you, motivated you to write that book? Yes, so that... Um like a lot of my work that actually came out of smaller projects so it started off that i was i was again opportunity knocked i was approached to contribute a a, a chapter to a, a book series called the ward uh. and the ward was about the historical community in the center of downtown toronto that used to essentially be a multicultural multi-ethnic community in the late 19th and early 20th century mm -hmm. and so the ward was leveled and covered up and it gave birth to what we now know as university avenue 
Mm. Like that University Avenue stretch was a main part of the ward. And so when they uncovered, they were looking to do, uh, to build um, a new structure in a parking lot behind City Hall. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And they had to do a dig. They did a dig and then they, they started to hit artifacts. And the minute you hit artifacts, you have to bring in archaeologists to like excavate, right? And, mm-hmm. and so they did the excavation and they found like hundreds of thousands of artifacts from mm-hmm. the ward. So mm-hmm. things that people had left behind. And, and you know, we don't realize that when, when a street is laid, concrete is laid over top earth. And yes. so what also happened is that that concrete had actually kind of settled in a weird way where what was the ward was preserved so they could still actually see some of the plumbing and the area like they could just they could see where people lived oh that's amazing it is amazing yes so at that dig they found an uncle tom's cabin plate Mm. so uncle tom's cabin is the 1852 novel written by harriet beecher stowe and Mm. there was this plate and they thought how bizarre that you would find this in the middle of toronto this this artifact that signals back to centuries ago. I happen to know someone by the name of John um, Lawrence, who Mm -hmm. is a writer, who also is an editor at Spacing, where Mm -hmm. I'm also a contributor. And so he right away thought of me. He said, Cheryl should write about this. So then I met with the editors and they're like, okay, would you like to contribute a chapter on this plate? So then I wrote the chapter And it was around the same time I was teaching a Black Canadian Studies course at U of T. Mm -hmm. And as part of that course, I was talking about the Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site, which Mm -hmm. is in Dresden, Ontario. So I casually said in class one day, hey, why don't we take a road trip down to Dresden to visit Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site? Yeah. A few students said that's a great idea. So then we met <laughs> one day, we drove down to Dresden, we walked through the site and mm-hmm. I I just had a lot of issues with what I was seeing. Mm. So because I'm also a very curious person mm. and I like, to, I like to use my curiosity for something and I've been gifted the, the gift really of being able to articulate that through writing. Good. I, I worked, I said, I'm gonna write something about my trip. So then I ended up writing a peer reviewed article that is all about the Uncle Tom's Cabin historic site and and, and its connection to the town and Uncle Tom. Long story short is that those two iterations led to John Lawrence, Mm -hmm. who is basically a colleague and friend, to for him as a 50 something white man to start doing some reflecting. And he said to himself, you know, I've never read Uncle Tom's Cabin. So he went out independent of me and Mm -hmm. and started reading Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book intrigued him. He said, do you want to meet for coffee? I have so many questions about the book. We met for coffee and I was just talking extemporaneously about the book. And he sat back and said, this, what you just said is a book. (laughs) (laughs) He said to me, John Lawrence is also an editor at Coach House Books. Yes. He said, I'm going to talk to Elena, who is the editor of the of that house. Yeah. And I, I think this is a book. And next thing you know, I'm signing a contract. And next thing you know, I wrote a book. <laughs> so that's literally... Oh, that's amazing. That's interesting. Yeah, that's it. That's the story. Opportunity knocked. Networking, said, yes. Yeah. That's great. Opportunity, yeah. networking, the right networks. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, that's literally what happened. And I think I love telling that story because, you know, people often think that that you somehow authors, maybe some authors are gifted with some kind of genius where they're just always just churning out books. No, there is a team of people or you have a muse, someone who is kind of helping you generate these ideas. You do the work, you write the book, but it's not all you. There, There's always someone or some or persons Mm -hmm. who are there in the ideation phase and in the phase, especially at the last stages of a book, the editing, the last editing phase, you don't do that by yourself. It is a team of people Mm -hmm. who go comb through this book. (laughs) You would not believe how many times books get edited before they get published. Yes, that's true. And, And to be honest, I'm also the type of person where I love the process. So I actually, I'm, I'm going to be working on a, on a third book um, 
I'll start writing that later this year. And I love the process of book writing because it, it even though you you are author and you put the words on the page, right? It, it's a collaborative project. It is. And I and I like collaborating with people, and I I love feedback and and thinking about how I can make something better, and mm -hmm. so so for me writing that book was was I learned a lot through the process. Okay, great. Now, where can for for listeners, where can they get your book? So that book you can buy at Coach House Books, um, Amazon, Indigo. Um, it's available in stores at all your independent book stores as well as indigo in, in chapters in Canada. Okay, great. Uncle Race, Nostalgia and the Politics of Loyalty. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Final question for you. <laughs> uh, you have an impressive bio and you are a young person, really. Your work on Canada's creative industries and its relationship with Black cultural representation has not, definitely not gone unnoticed. How do you, position Canada's creative futures in your research? I mean, the first thing to answering this question is I always try to, in all, all my students, especially Black students, to get them to think beyond the national borders, right? Like, don't be so stuck on you know, oh, I'm Canadian and the market is really in the US. So now you think you have to pick up everything and move to America. It's like those borders are actually not even real. Like imagine they're just, ima they're imagined spaces, one. Yeah. And then two, to actually think about, you know, in, in my intro course, for example, I have a whole discussion about innovation that always blows the student's mind <laughs> because everybody thinks, that they have to be new you know the the definition of creativity is is out of nothing right you create something mm -hmm. innovation is not that like innovation does not have to be entirely new i'm so glad that, that you've raised that point that's such right. an important point that a it lot is. of people miss they do like innovation is often a modification on an existing product service or way of being and so and and then something or something taken from the past and repurposed into a different sector a different use and so it's really not it's getting people to understand that the the future of creativity for me is 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 not getting stuck on the form that you're interested in right. so you know a lot of people for example if you are a visual artist you're only drawing inspiration from visual artists it's like well are you crazy <laughs> because you should be drawing inspiration from a myriad of things and thinking about how you can remix it as a visual artist into what you're doing exactly and, and then when you do that people are going to say oh my gosh this is so new we've never seen anything right and i think like take andy warhol why do people love Warhol so much? Mm -hmm. Because he's the first person to realize you could just take something from popular culture and remix it into a visual art form. And mm -hmm. people are going to think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Right. When really all you're looking at is a reproduction of Campbell's soup. <laughs> Seriously. At the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> it's Campbell's soup. <laughs> Like it's the same Campbell's soup that you would see lined in the shelf, the, the store shelf, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't think anything that was so special. Suddenly, when it's done in acrylic and it's on and it's and it's framed and put on the wall, you're like, oh my gosh, it's art. So Andy Warhol in the art world was really the first to realize that all you need to do is modify an existing form mm -hmm. and and introduce it to a new audience who've never seen that form before. Okay. And so I try to get people to understand that. And and because for me, that's what creativity is, as opposed yeah. to racking your brain to be some creative genius to create something the world has never seen in, in its in its 2000 plus year existence. It's like, but don't you understand that no one has ever done that? Yes, that's true. even even if we take the automobile. Mm -hmm. Take the car. Yeah, yeah. The, the truth is, 
the bicycle had to be created first. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Because they had to they had to imagine what wheels would look like. And then when the then they said, you know, we should take the same wheels from the bike and put it on the car. But we have to widen it because it's a wider frame. Like if you think about you it, go. it's actually the same form, right? That was yeah. just modified for a new technology. So some of this is actually just getting out of your head. Mm -hmm. And I think part of being creative is getting out of your head and, mm -hmm. and realize that that you know the you know that phrase, the world is your oyster. Right. Inspiration is literally all around you if you pay attention to it. And I think, and I think that especially, and I, I, I often implore this on black students, especially because I think sometimes black students are trying to reproduce sort of a Eurocentric frame of how to show up, how to think, how to create. When the truth is the amazing thing about, this is just truth about being black and or non-white and an immigrant mm -hmm. is that you're always existing in what's known as a third space right i didn't invent that term that's homie baba going mm -hmm. back to 1993 where he, and and the post-colonial work that was coming out of the late 80s and early 90s in general was like you are able to see to to know what your homeland or the the people of the dominant culture you can think like them because mm -hmm. you went to school with them right but you have your quote unquote other space yeah. that is yeah. your cultural background your you're an immigrant your homeland but because you're now living in this space you actually can take from both spaces so the, the richness of what you as a diasporic subject can actually produce mm -hmm. But a lot of times what happens, you want to deny your cultural heritage, your homeland, because you think it's backwards or it's slow or it doesn't have this. And you want to assume the dominant culture's way of thinking and making and doing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and then you don't understand why you're not being successful. Right. It's That's because you're not, being, you're, you're not being authentic. Yeah. And That's your authentic true. self as this diasporic subject is actually both. You don't need to eliminate or deny either one you just have to find that that groove of working in between within both of those spaces and then mm -hmm. you create this third space that is just amazing <laughs> and 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 can bring you so much joy in life because you're actually showing up as yourself that's such an enlightening point you know really great conversation and we could actually even go on furthermore and delve more into what you do because there, there's so much that you're doing and you've done that we haven't even spoken about but perhaps for another time another time <laughs> yeah so is there any last uh comment that you'd like to make based on you know the conversation today or just on creative on resilience in the creative space yeah i mean uh, i think the last you know last thing to say is where you start is does not have to be where you end up people's beginning most people have a tragic story in their childhood in their younger years if it's not childhood teenage or 20s there's something that happened that was just so horrible and it, it you know and then you you have a decision do you walk right. around do you walk around with this thing rest of your life and now you're 60 talking about, oh, you don't understand 50 years ago, this happened. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, or yeah. do you, or do you take the lesson of all the creative geniuses that we have probably, that you and I and many others know in our lifetime to exist, do you figure out a way to use it to improve your life? Mm -hmm. You just have to use it. Your life is literally here to be used for you to dig deep, to heal, to do the things that you have to do. Your life is not here to get stuck on an incident that happened. And then for the rest of your life, you're angry at everyone and you're blaming everyone for what happened to you. That is so important and essential to moving forward, isn't it? Yeah, and also moving forward, but also thinking about the fact that if, I always say this to people, especially religious people, if you believe that everything happens for a reason, right? They'll always tell you, oh, God didn't put me here for no reason. And, and, and yet when something bad happens, you get stuck on it. 
<laughs> and you don't say to yourself, oh, this must also be showing up for a reason. Right, right, right. Instead, you want to eliminate it and blame it for what's happened to you. Yeah. So for me, I take the good and the bad and, and say, well, this is showing up for a reason. What can I do with it? Yeah. How can I grow? How can I learn something new about myself? Mm -hmm. And believe me, I've had, I've had a lot of successes, but I've had a lot of challenges, like extreme challenges. Mm -hmm. I just don't walk with those challenges because they were part of the story. Oh, you know, that's, that's true. They're part of the story. And they probably like, made made you more a, a better a better person and absolutely. more good at what you do in your work. Absolutely, you know, so, it's like yeah. I'll give the I'll give the last analogy. I give the example of cake. You know why we love cake so much? Mm. Tell me. Because we don't eat it every day. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen a bunch of people when you put a cake? Oh, there's a cake! Yes, <laughs> they get so excited. Yeah. It's because it's not something that you enjoy frequently. Mm -hmm. It's like a one-off thing. Yeah. And so because it's a one-off thing, you really appreciate it. And I say, look at life the same way as that cake. It's like most of it, most of the things in your life, very mundane, routine. You get up, eat the same breakfast. Design. But when the cake shows up, appreciate it <laughs> and don't take it for granted. Okay, that's a, that's such a good point. <laughs> that's such a good point to end the, the discussion, the, the chat on, you know? see the cake, enjoy it. It's not something that you see all the time, but when you see that opportunity out there, grab it. Yes, because how many times, how many times you've been to a party, that cake comes out, someone's like, no, 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 I, I don't, I can't have any of that. Yeah. And they're like, what is, and they're like, oh, I'm on a diet. Leave the diet. You don't eat cake every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing of an opportunity shows up. It's amazing. You say, no, 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 that's not what I do. Oh, oh, I'm not really ready for that. So famous last words, if you want to, if you want to have things, if you want to get things in life, you, you actually have to be in a, in a place to receive them. Mm -hmm. And if you're turning down cake, the energy is just going to be energy of you say no to things. <laughs> That's true. You're not open to things. You say mm -hmm. no, you shut them down. Right. And I think when people start getting used to saying yes to the thing that even makes seem a little scary, mm -hmm. I, I really do believe that's when success starts to just roll into your life in many different ways. How inspiring. Seriously, Dr. Thompson, thank you. No, you're welcome. This has been such a great discussion, insightful and stimulating as well in terms of pushing us to go forward in our own spaces, in terms of what we do whether it's in the creative industry or the, the cultural industries or otherwise. So thank you. And I hope, you know, you join us another time, perhaps in another session, webinar or otherwise, where we can delve more into what other areas that other things that you're working on. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it's a great conversation. And, you know, I always come and just try to tell the truth, my truth. So and that, that matters, that counts. Thank you. You're welcome.